I'm, I'm originally I'm from upstate New York. I was born in Plattsburgh, New York. It's about 65 miles from Montreal, Canada. Okay. And when I was 17, I joined the army. And since then, I've been all over the world. And until I retired in, in 78, and uh, I uh, ran a restaurant, my, my wife, myself, ran a restaurant in, in up by Fort Hood, Texas, had a mom and pop uh, restaurant. And until about 10 years ago, everything was going good, but then we started, that Agent Orange kind of got me, ate me up. Uh, they, they've got more things in me, but you can, <laughs> then you can shake a stick at it, but uh, uh, they called me and they said, yeah, you're coming up here. So that was March the of uh, 204. And we've been here ever since. I lost my wife on January 12th this year. She she passed away. But, uh, and my daughter, she's she's like a little puppet, man. She, I can't do nothing. <laughs> she drives me all over the the country, and because right now I'm in a, I'm on medicines that they say don't drive. <laughs> um, could you go ahead and state your name first, sir? I'm sorry, I uh, forgot to ask that at the beginning. Franklin Favreau. Franklin Favreau. And uh, what unit were you assigned to during your your time, sir? Well. If I was to tell you from the start to beginning, there would be no end. But uh, in 19, I'll go for it, from the time I was in Vietnam. I was supposed to go to Vietnam in, in June of 1967, but my wife was having a baby. So they postponed me until after she had it. And it came September and it still hadn't come. My, uh, uh, company commander told me, he says, you know what? He said, when you get that girl, he said, you're going to have to register in college <laughs> by the time she gets here. So anyway, I finally, she finally got here in September, and they cut me orders for January 1st. I landed in Saigon on January 1st, and all hell broke loose. <laughs> Had uh, a C-130, all they did is drop the tailgate, and they said, get. This one poor guy, he was in a band, and we're in khakis. And he had his duffel bag, and he stood there and literally pissed his pants all over the place. I had to grab him and pull him off the off the runway. He was froze. He wouldn't move. That was the my first year. I was ground liaison for for the uh, Marines Third Math up in Da Nang for about three months. Then they shipped me down to the Fan Rang Air Force Base. I ended up for the rest of the year at Fan Rang as a liaison for the Air Force. That was my first year. This, the, uh, I ended up on the 15th of December getting orders to go back home. And Ted Offense hit on 68 January. So I missed that thing. Uh, then I went back to Fort Hood and they, uh, I was there for about, well, until 1970. January 70, back to Vietnam again. I joined, uh, I got in with the, the uh, 101st Airborne, and we were up in Fubai. Fubai and, and LZ Sally to start with. And uh, we, we, I, well, I ended up there until after they closed, they shut down. They were starting to, about August, they started shutting down everything. And we were starting to get things and pull out. And I left there on on uh, January uh, of uh, 71, back to Fort Hood. <laughs> and that's where I stayed until I retired. All right, sir. Um. Do you have maybe one or two events that might stick out in your head about Vietnam that you would like to share with us, sir? Well, most of most of my time, I was like I say, I was radio communication liaison, and uh, 
I used to have to travel by C-130 anywhere I went. And this one, one time I come, I needed to get to Saigon and I got to the airport and the guy looked at me, he says, you got a wheezy stomach? I said, no. He says, go in the back of the airplane. Went back to the airplane, loaded with bodies. He says, that's what you'll have to fly with. They can't hurt me. I said, they're, they're not the ones that's going to hurt me. It's those boys out there. <laughs> they're still kicking. So uh, that was one of the, uh, the guys. The guy says, uh, well, I guess you can fly with them. <laughs> that was one incident. Another incident, I was up in Fan Rang and my uh, radio heated up so bad that it burned up. So the guy gave, told tell me, he says, here's a C-130, here's a uh, order slip. He said, I'm going to send you to Cameron Bay. He said, they got a place up there. He said, they got all kinds of communication gears. Go up there, pick what you want up. I went up there and I picked me a brand new he loaded it on the plane and back to Fan Ram. <laughs> I used to have a lot of fun because we all, we'd go all over the place. I traveled by plane all the time until I got got in uh, Fubai one, uh, one 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 day. I had to drive all the way to Da Nang, about a 35, 40 mile drive. And it came nighttime, and all I could hear was Bing, Bing. <laughs> <laughs> so I just stepped on the gas and said, good way, move out. He's thinking, well, uh, you're going down because <laughs> I'm not stopping. The, uh, the company commander says, well, didn't you carry your weapon with you? I said, would you stop and try to find out who's shooting at you? He said, no. Well, I said, me either. <laughs> so I've had little instances like that all the way. Like flying, one time I had to take three days code to the firing places and I had the colonel's helicopter, this little bubble. He takes off and he heads out over the, the golf and he starts diving these little pubertina the bolts. He says, they're all Vietnamese, yeah. But he says, you'd be surprised what, what Vietnamese is behind that. <laughs> He said, they're not order or normal ones. They're all VC up and down and like that there. And he used to love to dive at them. I said, cool little boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had, we, I had a lot of fun over there. I can't really complain. Uh, was it wasn't easy at some times, but like I say, when you hear pinging, <laughs> you know you're being shot at. It's just like uh, I, I, we had to worry about our own people. When I was uh, at go to bed at night, I'd keep three mattresses under my bunk and three on the on the side because they would roll grenades up under us. Our own people. Could you could you describe maybe the feelings that would come with that? You know, knowing that it was your common soldiers that that were doing that kind. Of yeah, there were marijuana dopers, what they were. And we, we had a odd house I used to go to. Well, one day I went there and uh, started looking through the thing and all this marijuana. So I'm taking it down and dumping it. And then I, I dumped on it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's one reason why they weren't too happy with me. Then where they'd get their marijuana was a, well, 120 acres sitting out there growing wild. So we'd spray it with diesel oil and we'd send a mash to it. <laughs> we thought it was fun. They didn't. <laughs> well, yeah, things like that. I mean, that's why you, you get think of a lot. At the time, they're not, they're not funny because they were watching you. <laughs> Yeah, that was, that was something else. It's, it's a, a trip I enjoyed. 
I did enjoy being shot at it, but <laughs> I guess I had the good Lord looking at me because I went through two doors of it. Um, can you describe how you how you feel that the state did with putting this on and, and what it This was the most beautiful it? thing that they ever could have done. I, I, I've i been happier than pig eating bright, shit in the briar patch. <laughs> That I never expected it. And I was a little leery when I came up. In fact, but after I got here, man, everything just unfolds. That's beautiful. How, yeah. how do you think the the veterans, as a, a general populace, you know, are are feeling out here? Could you, could you describe the atmosphere? You know, of everyone else too, sir. Oh yeah, even even the civilians. Surprised the heck out of me because like I said, when I came home, they told me to don't wear your uniform, and I found out why. <laughs> but how do you hide that? <laughs> <laughs> Those military haircuts give it away every time. Yeah, you do that. <laughs> you can hide your body, but you can't hide that head. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it wasn't funny coming. Then I re-enlisted over there. And I actually hitchhiked from Vietnam to El Paso, Texas, and back. Could you describe that? I mean, that's got to be an amazing journey. That sure. was. Well, they, when I uh, got my orders, they said you're going to got to go to fat to uh, uh, well, heck, Saigon and catch a plane out. So I got to uh, Da Nang. And there was a plane set out there, and I saw all these guys in uniform that had Navy and Marines. And so I went over there and I says, uh, Where's the plane you go? He says, States. Uh, <laughs> you got any room in there? He said, Hell yeah. He says, I got about 10 more seats. He says, Check your gun. I had to lock, I'd get my gun locked up. Said, get on, I was still in uniform, fatigues. And uh, got on the plane, he always says, I just gotta remind you, when we hit Hawaii, we'll be stopping refuel. He said, don't let them find you, <laughs> not in fatigues. And I said, okay. So when we got off, I snuck and I got behind a post like this here and waited. And the guy looked over at me, to, I shot back into the plane, <laughs> got up, got up in northern North uh, California, and we landed there. And I, when I walked out of there, what do I walk into? About six officers, full birds and above. I thought, uh oh, too late. The one officer looks at me, says, "Where are you going, soldier?" I says, "El Paso." Just a minute. He, said, he looks over there. He says, "Hey, we got any room?" The guy says, "Yeah." He said, "We could hold about three or four more." I said, oh, good. I've got one more. <laughs> Within 24 hours, I hitchhiked from from Fubai. That's way up on the DMZ. All the way to El Paso. Made it. That's something. That's yeah. That's amazing. And then it took me three days to get back. <laughs> I would have would have gotten back sooner, but uh, I had a couple of generals that decided they wanted to the plane themselves. So they they hopped the plane and we sat there for another day. <laughs> but uh, it was fun. Like I say, I've I've had a I've had a ball put twenty years in. That's something to be proud yeah. of, sir. Um, is there anything else you might want to state? Just thank you for what you're doing today. This has been amazing and I enjoyed it. I'm glad you enjoyed it. So you guys definitely deserve it. You really do. Um, do either of you guys have any questions? I do, did, and I couldn't hear it the whole interview, so if you talked about it, that's fine. Did you talk about your experience with Agent Orange? Oh, no, oh, no I didn't say anything about that. Could you? <laughs> I mean, it's not very pretty, you see me. I know, but I think it's really important to capture if you're willing to. Okay. 
When I came back from Vietnam, I was healthy as a, as, as you and I. I mean, to me, they, nothing wrong. And about, uh, oh, I'd say about 15 years after I got out, retired, I started having problems. I ended up with two strokes, two heart attacks, uh, colon cancer. I had my second pacemaker. And it all do from Agent Orange. I can't walk from my feet. This knee here is bone on bone. I got neuropathy from the knees down. I try to stand and I can't stand. Especially if, if I try to put this down first. And this knee here, I'll go flip, flip right out over. But uh, it, it, what got me with the Agent Orange fact was the thing is that they kept telling us, oh, that's nothing. It's a foliage killer. You ain't got to worry about it. Yeah, that was right. But boy, I'll tell you the way they poured it on us. <laughs> I would be in my uniform and I'd be soaking wet with that. I'd head for the showers. I just I turned on the showers and stand under it for about a half an hour to just rinse off. I'd get my clothes all rinsed off. I'd take them and I threw them away. I had to buy more if I had to, but <laughs> they gave them to me. But, uh, uh, I'd clean off double soap <laughs> in order to get that stuff off. It didn't burn. You couldn't feel any any difference. It was just like water pouring on you. But it's the after effects what happened. Because they all that that hit me all all through, after all the years. It took time to to go through me. But it's left me with a like my my heart doctor telling me he says. You are a challenge. <laughs> but he says he liked the challenge, so I said, well, you go ahead with it. <laughs> what do you attribute your optimism to? You're not, you seem to be like you're an optimistic guy. I am. I am. I am. I, I, I believe in life and the way it has to go, that's the way it goes. There's not much we can do about it. He's the boss upstairs. <laughs>